Welcome to the weekly worship service from Omimi Baptist Church. These are days when the COVID epidemic has cut off our usual visits, hugs and kisses from friends and even from family and loved ones. For some of us, that has meant being unable to visit in a hospital, a retirement home, or a nursing home with somebody that we love and who needs us, or even spending time with someone who has lost a loved one, just being there to help ease some lonely hours. And for churches all over the world, this is a challenge and a restriction for which no seminary training could prepare us. Please know that you are still loved, and please remember that in time this all will pass. As Vera Lynn sang at a very difficult time in history, there will be bluebirds over the white cliffs of Dover. Tomorrow you just wait and see. I'm also very much aware of the privilege of speaking with you through technology, where our worship service from Omimi Baptist Church is available immediately anywhere in the world. Just by connecting in or clicking into the link, you invite me into your home or wherever else you may be just now for a short while. I respect your time and your freedom to choose. Thank you for the privilege. May you be blessed today. This is Pastor Gordon Finlay. Loving Heavenly Father, you know how the inconvenience of COVID-19 has affected everybody in this entire world. And yet we know at the same time that you are sovereign and you're the Lord of glory. And so we would ask ourselves today under the searchlight of your Holy Spirit, whether in fact you wish to use this time to develop in each one of us fruit of the Holy Spirit as Galatians 5 reminds us that that fruit is made up of love, joy, and peace, of patience, kindness, and goodness, of faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
and perhaps you wish to develop in any one of us more love for humanity, more love for the people who share life with us, more love for the people on our street, more joy in our daily lives, more evidence of peace, more patience in the difficulties of everyday life, that you want us to be kinder and better people, more faithful and gentle, and exercising personal self-control. We pray that these may develop in our lives to the honor and glory of the great Almighty Lord God. That which is forged in the furnace is always harder and stronger and more durable. And if these are developed in us in the furnace of COVID-19, surely they will be permanently developed in our lives under your guidance. Help us and lead us forward, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, just before our scripture reading, let us ask God's blessing on this word. Our Heavenly Father, how we thank you that you have provided us with your word. It's there waiting for us to discover and to open our own hearts and minds to the best of our ability and then to invite you to please speak to us. We ask that you would open our hearts and minds in ways that we're not able to, that we may understand the wonderful and beautiful stream of everlasting life that you have placed before us, resourced in your word, provided through your Son, and available to us in the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly, and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh.
I'd like to begin today by wishing you a very happy new year on the first Sunday of 2021. May your life be richly blessed this year. May you make significant new discoveries in the spiritual realm as you walk with Christ. Epiphany, also called the Feast of Epiphany, celebrates the first manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles. It's represented in Scripture by the visit of the Magi found in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 2. The word translated as epiphany refers to manifestation or revelation. We celebrate it usually 12 days after Christmas, approximately. After a four-month journey following the guidance of the Star of Bethlehem, the Magi arrive in Judea, seeking him who is born King of the Jews. We believe that the Magi were Oriental philosophers who served in the courts of kings and emperors, advising them on various subjects. They studied the night sky for anything unusual, including the appearance of stars that had not been seen before, and they interpreted their presence and importance for the king and country. Magi comes from the Greek word magos, which in turn is from the old Persian word magupati. Magupati was the title given to priests in a section of the ancient Persian religion such as Zoroastrianism. They were held in high esteem, and many of them may have been quite wealthy, sometimes known as astronomers or astrologers. In the book of Daniel in our Old Testament, the kings of Babylonia all had their own wise men as advisors, variously described as magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, sorcerers, diviners, soothsayers. Daniel was given divine wisdom above all of them by the Lord God and was greatly favored by more than one of their kings. He was highly respected in their culture as a wise man among his generation, and his influence lived on for years to come. The prophecies given to Daniel recorded in Daniel chapter 7 point to the sure coming of the promised Messiah and it's referred to by Christ and his apostles directly or indirectly. And to quote from the homiletical commentary, perhaps more than any other portion of the Old Testament of similar extent are they quoted by Christ and the apostles. The book of Daniel was greatly respected and cherished among Jewish scholars, and its promises of the coming Messiah of God were held close to heart. It's hardly a surprise, then, that the lamp of hope continued to shed light among the people of the world during those dark days and years yet to come, and that their hope and their confidence spread beyond the surrounding Gentiles. Various writers refer to a general expectation, both among Jews and Gentiles at that time, that some great and influential king would arise whose influence would reach far and wide. Briefly, as examples of that general expectation around that time and following, we refer to Roman historians Tacitus and Suetonius. So I want to refer then to these two Roman historians, both of whom referred to Magi. Tacitus lived from 56 AD to 120 AD, and in the Encyclopedia Britannica he is described as probably the greatest historian and one of the greatest prose stylists who ever wrote in the Latin language. From 97 AD, he was a proconsul in the Roman government, and from 112 to 113, he was a proconsul of Asia. Secondly, Suetonius was a close friend of the Roman senator Pliny the Younger. He came into favor with Emperor Trajan, who ruled from 98 to 117 AD, and Emperor Hadrian, who ruled from 117 up to 138 AD. Suetonius is mainly remembered for his writing called The Life of Twelve Caesars. He chronologed the work and the life of Julius Caesar and all the way through to the Domitian Emperor. Both of these historians, writing 60 to 70 years after the fact, that everywhere around the East there were men looking for the coming of a great king who was to rise from among the Jews. This may have reflected the predictions of Daniel 7, 
If Christ had come in wealth and power and pomp and ceremony, it's likely that a waiting world would have welcomed him according to the expectation described here by Tacitus and Suetonius. Coming to a peasant couple from Nazareth and being born in such humble circumstances and then placed in a manger, he did not match their expectations of grandeur. But there was an expectation here and there and everywhere that a great king was coming. Perhaps we can say that the arrival of the Magi from the East was not out of character in the period of history described by Matthew chapter 2. It's quite natural for us to wonder how many Magi traveled from the East to do obeisance to the child who had been born King of the Jews. All we know for sure is what Matthew tells us, and he does not say how many there were. Now, because they presented three gifts— it's sometimes assumed that there were just three of them. In this regard, Western tradition sets the number at three, but Eastern tradition sets the number at twelve. As early as the third century, the Magi were considered to have been kings, and around the eighth century they were known by individual names. This is Saria, Melchior, Gathaspa. Their names appear in the chronicle known as Exerta Latina Barbari. So after a four-month journey from the east, we can be absolutely certain that a number of magi would never travel alone in a small number. Important people of influence and power and wealth would have camels to ride on and others to carry supplies of food and other necessities. With them, they would have servants and armed guards to protect against thieves and robbers who eyed their money and their treasures. They would bring their own cooks and their supply of food so that they weren't dependent on purchasing from locals along the way. And possibly, they would have musicians to soothe their minds towards sleep. And those who could fan them in the hot, humid nights. And, of course, safety was so important so that they could let their guard down in slumber. So the size of the retinue is an indication of their rank and their prestige. So I want to suggest that it would be virtually impossible for just three magi to have traveled alone. So yes, we think about the number of the magi, but secondly, we may wonder about the homage that they came to offer. Matthew 2 verse 11 says that on going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. And then opening their treasures, or their treasure bags, they presented to him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. We have just come through the Christmas season in which the giving of gifts is of major importance. At the jewelry store, we're strongly reminded that diamonds are a girl's best friend. At the Laura Secord store, we're told that a box of delectable chocolates are the sure and certain way to her heart. And then certain stores remind us of their slogans and their catchphrases that they too need our business and we need their product. From the pre-COVID days, there's the story told of a small boy who invaded the lingerie department of a large Californian department store and shyly presented his problem to a female clerk. I want to buy my mom a present of a slip, he said, but I don't know what size she wears. Is she tall or short? Is she fat or skinny? asked the clerk. The boy was silent for a moment and then he said she's just perfect as he beamed. Well, the lady had to guess at the size, and she wrapped up a size 34 for him. Obviously, she's perfect. Two days later, Mum came into the store and exchanged the size 34 for a size 52. Buying an appropriate gift for somebody is especially important if you want to make a good impression, and gifts can have symbolic meaning. Perhaps the gifts of the Magi could be understood as specimens of the very best products of their country. Or perhaps they should be understood as symbolic, with specific meaning attached to each. It reminds me of the weeks before I left my country of origin to emigrate at age 17 to Canada. 
My parents suggested that I take the bicycle and visit with a number of relatives and neighbors. And one of these was a relative known to us, a Mrs. Johnson, who lived about four or five miles from us. She served me a favorite, freshly made Irish potato bread cooked over the open hearth. And then she gave me several small gifts, one of which was a bottle opener with three brass monkeys on the upper end. She wished me well on my Canadian venture and never gave me advice on how to live or behave or get along in the new world. Over the years that have come and gone, I have cherished and preserved that bottle opener, and when I look closely at the three brass monkeys, I come to understand that they represent the Japanese maxim known as the three wise monkeys, which may also have had roots in ancient Chinese wisdom, of course. The three monkeys are Mizaru, Kizazaru, and Iwazaru, my my pronunciation of uh, Japanese isn't very good, but the first one means one who sees no evil covering the eyes, one who hears no evil covering the ears, one who speaks no evil covering the mouth. In reflection, I realized that this dear lady had given me a very important gift, a symbolic gift that spoke without words. In fact, she was giving me advice without words. Ever since, it has reminded me of the importance of what we look at and what we listen to and what we speak. Those three monkeys. Yes, gifts can have strong symbolic significance. So when the Magi selected specific gifts to present to the baby Jesus, the king, they needed to choose. Matthew's gospel tells us then about the three gifts, the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. And I'd like to look at each of them specifically. Gold, universally recognized as the emblem of royalty, the gift that is fitting for a king. This is a way of saying that while the baby may be more interested right now in a warm meal and a comfortable place to sleep and the soothing voice and protecting arms of loving parents, the day will come when he grows into maturity. He has a kingdom to occupy and a world to rule. And we, as representatives the whole of the whole Gentile world, we as magi from outside of Judaism, have come to say that for much too long we have lived in darkness. May he who is the light of the world let his light shine in our hearts, our homes, and our lives too. May he be our king. And so, opening their treasures, they present to him who is king at his birth gold in recognition of his kingship. Approximately 33 years later, as recorded in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus informed his disciples, all power is given to me in heaven and on earth. The Greek word translated here as power refers to the full authority of the King of Glory. Have you submitted to his authority and his rule in your life? The second gift that they selected and presented was frankincense. This was one of the ingredients of the sacred incense according to Exodus 30 verses 34 and 35, and it was known to have grown in Persia and Arabia. It burned on the altar of incense in the tabernacle. In ancient Persian sculptures, we find this being burned before the king. So if this is accurate, frankincense also had royal significance in the minds of those who came. Among Jewish people, we understand that frankincense was the emblem of divinity. And if that is a correct understanding, then the symbolic meaning of this gift is a recognition that this child is in fact a divine king. As we today might express it, the divine king, the one and only Son of God. Have you taken time to reflect on what that means for you? That he coming in a human body is actually the divine king who, as Handel expressed it, shall reign for ever and ever. Amen. And then the third gift which they present to him is myrrh. Myrrh? Of what possible use would myrrh be to a king? And for what possible reason did they bypass all the other treasures before them in their treasure bags? 
rubies and diamonds and pearls of great price and ivory carvings, all of which I am sure they had with them. Myrrh? The well-known gum resin that we know as myrrh was extracted from the Arabian balsamodendron. It was used by the Egyptians for embalming, according to Herodotus, an ancient Greek scholar who lived almost 500 years before the birth of Christ. In John 19, verse 20, we learn that Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds so that he and Joseph of Arimathea might embalm the now lifeless body of Jesus after taking it from the cross. They would embalm it and place it in Joseph's own new garden tomb. Is it just possible, my friend, that these Gentile magi were divinely guided to select myrrh as the third gift symbolic of the death of the Lamb of God, of the King in the manger, who would die for the sins of humanity, the suffering servant. Have you claimed him as your Savior and your Lord? Our closing prayer of benediction today comes from the book of Jude, the final verse, 24. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling, 
and to make you stand without blemish in the presence of his glory with rejoicing. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.